Please welcome to the stage Hassan Al Taudi, Secretary General, Head of Qatar 2022 World Cup, David Miliband, President of the International Rescue Committee, and our moderator, Matthew Swift. Ah, oh. well, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you so much, both of you, for being here, David and Hassan. It's very, very good to have you both. Thank you very uh, much. David, it's great to have you back at Thank Concordia. You. you were last year's award recipient, which obviously meant a great deal to our organization and our leadership council, so it's an honor to have you back here. Thank you. Um, and with great respect to the International Rescue Committee, of course. Thank you very much. Um, so we are going to shift topics rather dramatically <laughs> and talk about the World Cup 2022. Um, let's start first with you, Hassan. Um, talk a little bit about why Qatar bid on the World Cup, how uh, you locked it in, essentially, and won that bid, um, and where things currently stand. All right. Uh, why we bid? I think, uh, simply put, we're, uh, you know, we're a football-loving nation. I mean, a lot of people might not be aware that the Middle East and the Arab world are football fanatics. And, and to uh, my North American uh, colleagues, football equals soccer. So just, you know, but I'm gonna continue saying football. <laughs> uh, but we're, we're a football loving nation. So, so no doubts, you know, um, hosting uh, the first ever Middle Eastern World Cup was always a dream that we always had. Um, definitely, uh, you know, a very big dream, but, but one that, you know, we kind of pursued with a lot of passion. But also there was, there was another element to it as well. You know, as, as a football loving nation, we recognize the transformative power mm -hmm. that such a major event coming to the Middle East for the very first time would have on many different fronts. You know, not the least of it being you know, a, a bridge between different cultures for people of different backgrounds from different parts of the world. So as I said, we pursued it with a lot of passion. There was a lot of hard work in it. We uh, identified what challenges we had and every challenge that was put in front of us or every obstacle turned out to be a stepping stone. It was actually an advantage. Mm -hmm. So, for example, our size, you know, for us, we, we introduced the concept of a compact World Cup where fans could visit more than one stadium, more than one match a day. Uh, teams would be located within one accommodation and focus more on, the, on, on, on delivering on where it mattered, which was the pitch. So, again, we, we, we bid very hard with a lot of passion. We, we turn uh, disadvantages into advantages, and, uh, you know, we won the right to host the World Cup. And Amazing. since then, we've been... Uh, it's been nine years, no sleep, uh, continuous uh, work uh, on delivering on the big vision that we've had behind, behind the World Cup. How large of a team do you have? Oof. Uh, this, the organization I head has about 400 people. Uh, we've just uh, about two weeks ago uh, launched a call for volunteers uh, to assist us in delivering the World Cup, and we have about 100 and I think we've reached 178,000 uh, uh, people that have signed up for now. Wow. Um, and the team is growing. Incredible, incredible. So, David, let's take a giant step back. I want to go, uh, talk a little bit about International Rescue Committee from a broad perspective, which is the role of partnerships in, in IRC, uh, in, in your strategy and how you work. And then, of course, it, it will it'll connect to an important well, uh, conversation. Today. Yeah, look, I, I should uh, disabuse anyone here of one important fact. I am not here because I'm an Arsenal fan. <laughs> although that would be a nice to be here. And I'm not here because I'm going to be appearing in the 2022 World Cup, uh, sadly. Um, I'm here because the World Cup is a unique chance yeah. uh, to raise two sets of issues. Uh, relating to the refugee and displacement crisis yeah. that we face at the moment. One is a crisis of programs. The gap between the needs of refugees and displaced people and the provision for them, the health, the education, the support, the protection, that gap is growing. I was able to talk about this at the Concordia Summit last year when yeah. I explained there were 22 million refugees and 40 million internally displaced. Today, there are 25 million yeah. refugees, 42 million internally Displaced. So the crisis is growing, but there's a second issue, and we're meeting in the United States, and all of you know that over the last two or three years, as the refugee population has grown, the myths about who these people are, about whether they're innocent victims of other people's wars, or, or whether in fact they're a threat to others, that mythology around them has grown, and in too many places, too many cases, there has been the really um, quite awful uh, sense that refugees are being doubly victimized. Mm. The first time they're the victims of wars, and the second time they are perceived as a threat. 
And so the conversation that we've started is to contrast the people who go to visit a country that is hosting a World Cup, voluntarily travel with those who are forced from their own homes. And for us, thinking in a big way both about the programs that we develop, but also the consciousness and the wider set of issues about the way refugees and displaced people are seen is absolutely integral to every partnership we have. So if you remember the uh, conversation I had with Joe Gebbia of Airbnb of last year, it was partly about the fact that they were extending housing credits to our staff, but it was also about the fact that they were inviting all the hosts of Airbnb to host a dinner for local refugees to introduce themselves. And that double angle yeah. of programmatic excellence, but also challenging perceptions, is core to every global partnership that we try to develop. That's great, great. So Hassan, Generation Amazing has worked with refugees uh, in places like Jordan and Lebanon. Can you talk a little bit about Generation Amazing and what you're doing specifically for displaced people? Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> As I said, we believe in the transformative, transformative power of, of the World Cup. And when we won the right to host the World Cup, we wanted to make sure that we uh, harness that power in a positive way. So we launched Generation Amazing. Uh, it was actually during the bid, and then we re relaunched it again when we won the right around 2011. Uh, and it, simply put, it utilizes the power of football uh, in developing uh, leadership skills, organizational skills, communication skills, and civic engagement uh, uh, for uh, young people within uh, uh, underprivileged communities uh, to contribute to, 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 with, you know, to, to their communities and become leaders and, 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 and contribute more effectively within their own communities. Mm -hmm. So we've, uh, our target when we started was about a million people, to reach a million people by 2022. Uh, I'm very happy to say that today we've reached 250,000 people. Uh, we've launched, as you said, we've launched our, our programs in uh, Lebanon, in Jordan, in Pakistan, uh, in India, um, and it's, it's been a great success. But it's not just been about, uh, the, the ultimate vision behind it was how do we, how do we have you know, this, this, this fantastic medium, which is football, uh, how, do you, how do you allow that to kind of um, help an individual uh, assimilate themselves within, within the society and within the community that they're, that they're in. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was the original uh, uh, aim of the program. But of course, then I had, a, I had the pleasure of meeting David and sitting down and having a conversation. I came to realize that it's actually, it can actually become part of a bigger conversation. It can actually become part of uh, shedding the spotlight on, on a situation that I think day by day is growing worse and worse, both in terms of, I think as David said, on a programmatic level, but also on a perception level. And the first World Cup in the Middle East, we've always said it's a vehicle for change. It's a vehicle um, for, for uh, you know, to look beyond 2022 and see the impact that it has. And that's why we started the conversation with IRC uh, to, to enter into uh, uh, this partnership of, of utilizing the power of football, utilizing the first World Cup in the Middle East uh, to raise awareness on, on, on uh, uh, the refugee situation globally, mm -hmm. but at the same time also assist in terms of uh, on a programmatic level as well. So when thinking about using the power of sport, and, 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 and David, I want to ask you about this. Do you see this as a model for other things, the Olympics and, and other World Cups? Do you see this as setting a new model? Look, look the, the World Cup um, is seen by half of the global population. Yeah. That's the evidence from... Russia. I explained to Hassan a couple of things. First of all, the humanitarian response at the moment is too often short term. We run 400, 500 government grants, but the average length is a year. That's why this partnership that we're aiming for is an eight year partnership. Mm -hmm. Four years in the run up to the World Cup, four years beyond the World Cup. Secondly, I explained that too much of the humanitarian response doesn't learn lessons yeah. from one part of the world to the other. That's why our partnership is about five continents, yeah. five crises yeah. across the eight-year span. A third thing uh, I explained uh, to Hassan is that too often it's the young people who are short-changed in humanitarian response. So although half of the world's displaced people are under the age of 18, only 2% of the global humanitarian budget goes on education. And that's why our partnership is focusing first on education, mm -hmm. making sure that traumatized children are able to access education and rebuild their social and emotional strength. We'll, we'll learn the lessons of this extraordinary partnership that we've got with Sesame Workshop and take it uh, wider. 
but secondly, to also take seriously the agenda around youth empowerment. Because, yeah. frankly, we are shortchanging the future. There is a genuinely lost generation. So if you take those three things, a long-term partnership, not a yeah. short-term one, a partnership that goes across the world, not just for part of the world, and a partnership that breaks the back of this terrible failure to invest in youth, that, I think, lays the basis for us to do something really extraordinary. We can showcase yeah. amazing work in four years' time at the World Cup, but we can also rally the world to take on this deadening sense that nothing can be done about the refugee yeah. crisis, because together we absolutely reject that. But I think also, sorry, just to, just no, to add to what David said, I mean, again, you know, for us, when we're coming from the perspective of, of hosting this major tournament, it's, it's, it's an honor and it's a responsibility. Now, most host nations, or generally speaking, a lot of people focus on the 28 days, the lead up to the 28 days in terms of infrastructure preparedness, operational preparedness, and then what do you do during those 28 days? And then after that, when people talk about legacy, they look at it in terms of infrastructure and what do you leave behind? Yeah. Our vision was always wider than that. I mean, this is, you know, football, as Ed David said, you know, half the globe watches this game. But, you know, the game of football is, is, is one that literally ignites passion in every individual that follows it. It, it, it fuels you. It fuels you on, on you know, you can, you can be in, in any part of the world, not speak the language, but throw out a few words of, you know, Ronaldo, Messi, Arsenal, uh, Manchester United. And, uh, and you, you can have a conversation. It, yeah. it, it truly does unify and bring people together. There's that, there's that unbelievable power. It's an untapped power. Yeah. And to bring it, to, you know, for us to harness it and to, to allow for, you know, to, again, if you look at the legacy, you're talking about eight, four years behind the, beyond the World Cup, beyond 2022. So when the lead up to the World Cup, when it's, you know, when, when it's going to be hosted in Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, yeah you'll hopefully still be able to see the results of, 2020, of the World Cup in 2022. And maybe I'm hopeful that it inspires also the, you know, the future hosts of, the, of, of major tournaments as well to, to harness this, this, this transformative power. And David, and I'm sorry, I want everybody in the room to understand what you mean when you say five continents, five crises. Can you explain that just? Well, five so continents, well. I think people know what that yeah. uh, means. But the, uh, <laughs> um, we will take at least five crises, one per continent. Yep. So you can read in today's papers about the fact that over a million Venezuelans have fled to Colombia. Uh, last week, I was in Yemen, and I met displaced people from the port of Hodeida uh, there. Uh, we all know that the uh, crisis in the Democratic Republic of Congo or in South Sudan in Africa is a, an absolute blight on the yeah. people's lives there. So we will take each continent, because, yep. of course, each continent sends teams to the World Cup. Yes. We will pick at least one crisis in each continent. And in that crisis, over the next four years, we will deliver high-quality programs, not covering everything, but covering real impact on young people's education so that they're ready to learn, and real efforts at youth empowerment to make sure that they are, their needs are properly mm. addressed. That means we'll arrive at the World Cup with well-funded, well-organized, well-researched, and well-evaluated mm -hmm. measures and programs that show what is possible. And we'll then challenge the world to back us to go further. And the good thing about this partnership is that we'll learn as we go along. There's a real commitment to make sure that we do the evaluation, we do the monitoring, we build on best evidence, and we make sure that we really make an impact on five continents. Absolutely. So. Hassan, let's, uh, obviously we can see the power of sport globally, but what does this mean for Qatar? Oof, that's a very open-ended question, but uh, <laughs> simply, uh, well, for us, again, it's, it's, it's harnessing that power. That's, you know, every host nation usually decides on what it wants to benefit out of this, you know, what, what it wants to make out of this tournament. Mm -hmm. For us, when we came to the World Cup, you know, to, to bid, we wanted to make sure that it's a catalyst that assists the country in its development plan. So there's, a, there's an overall uh, 2030 vision, both in terms of um, urban development and urban planning. So there's a plan that the country has in terms of uh, expanding by 2030, which includes an, a significant investment in infrastructure, both in terms of expressways, uh, the development of the new metro system, um, ICT infrastructure required, and so on. Uh, but there was also another desire of, uh, when we're talking about development, which is part of the 2030 national vision, 
that looks at economic diversification, the idea of, of expanding our economy and not being purely a hydrocarbon economy. Mm -hmm. There's also a desire for human development, looking at ways of investing in education and, and uh, empowering youth and empowering the younger, gen younger generation. There's a social development initiative as well that, that addresses, uh, uh, again, the developments, the natural evolution within, within, within society for Qatar. And then, of course, there's the environmental uh, sustainability side of it. So these are all plans uh, that the country has as, uh, as part of its 2030 national vision. We took the plans for the World Cup, and we embedded every requirement that the World Cup has. We, we tried to make sure that it's a, a booster for the country's overall development plans. So when we talk about infrastructure, we worked on ensuring that we reprioritize, accelerate uh, certain initiatives that is required for the World Cup, mm -hmm. but more importantly, has a use beyond the World Cup, beyond 2022. Uh, when we looked at, for example, you know, the, the power of the World Cup that it has to, to develop several different industries uh, from, from our side as, as a country, uh, we're predominantly hydro based on the hydrocarbon industry, but there's other industries that, 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 that are in development, but I would say relatively embryonic stage in certain areas. The World Cup can assist and is assisting in, in, in accelerating a number of initiatives that the government has already undertaken in developing different industries within, within, within Qatar as well. Oh. Whether we're looking at the technology sector, whether we're looking at the hospitality sector and tourism sector. So effectively, it's, it's as I said, it's, it's a catalyst that is assisting us in achieving our goals. It's accelerating a lot of initiatives and a lot of goals that we have. One simple example would be, for example, the spotlight that is shed on, on workers' welfare. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the country was always committed on labor reforms, but uh, as a result of the significant expansion and this development that happened, uh, we fell short on enforcement. Uh, of course, with the World Cup, what it did was it, it, it accelerated a number of initiatives that were already in the pipeline, and today I'm very proud to say that significant progress has been made on workers' welfare, both whether it's the, the organization that I lead or whether as a, as a nation as well. So you can see the benefits of the World Cup on, on different, si different aspects of, of life in Qatar. Can we dig a little bit deeper, though, into workers' rights? Because I think it's, an important, it's an important subject to, to touch on when thinking about this. What, what has been your approach from the beginning on this? How do you, what, and, and I, I think what I'm asking more is, give specific, if you can, examples of, of how you've seen strategy implemented. Absolutely. Again, I think it's important also to put in context uh, uh, the situation as it was and since uh, the reforms have happened. Uh, previously, uh, as I said, the laws were in place, and yet, unfortunately, the, the enforcement uh, uh, situation was not up to par with, with what, what we, as Qataris, uh, you know, would, would have accepted and, and would have wanted. Uh, since, since, I think, I would, it's safe to say since 2011, significant progress has been made. Let's start off in terms of legislation. Sure. So uh, minimum wages have been introduced. It was not introduced before. Minimum wages have been introduced. Uh, passport confiscation uh, was something that was outlawed previously, uh, but a, as I said, there was, there was a failure in terms of enforcement, or let's say uh, we can call it a failure enforcement. Since then, uh, enforcement has increased quite significantly, quite extensively. Um, exit permits, mm -hmm. uh, and for those of you who might not be aware, previously there was a system where expats would have to, uh, have to accept, have to uh, require permission to leave the country. It was part of a system that we had, which, which was called the exit permit. This has been abolished. Since, the, since then, uh, it's been abolished. Uh, there was a, uh, probably, I think most of you might have heard it, but not been made, made aware of what it means, the kafala system, which is effectively a sponsorship system, uh, uh, which was based in Qatar previously. This has since been abolished as well. Now the relationship is based, contractual between the employer and the employee. Um, one of the areas that we, the initial, area that we focused on as a Supreme Committee and as well as a nation was uh, the horrendous uh, accommodation situation that some workers suffered from. And they were horrendous. I mean, you know, let's not mince words. Uh, certain workers lived in very, very uh, terrible conditions, and that was something that uh, was unacceptable, yeah. plain and simply. Um, since then, there's been a significant investment in developing um, uh, acceptable quality uh, accommodation, uh, um, accommodation units. Within the Supreme Committee, our approach has been also to engage with the contractors to ensure that uh, they develop accommodation uh, mm -hmm. facilities uh, uh, in line with our standards and to make sure that it's a sustainable element. So, so the idea is not that once the spotlight moves away, things revert back to what they were, yeah. but rather it's a long-lasting 
uh, impact, long-lasting, uh, permanent solution. Um, That's great. A lot. Well, well there's, there's a lot. I can go on and on and on. Sure. As you can see, my brain's kind of scattered all over the place because there's so much that we've done. But again, I think it's important to point out one thing. This is not a moment for us to kind of sit down and pat ourselves on the back. Yeah. And, and a lot of people assume when we uh, list out a lot of the achievements that we've done over the last few years that we're very happy and we're very satisfied with where we're at. Yeah. That's not the case. There's still a lot more to go. I think the situation of labor reform is a global situation. It's not limited to Qatar, but it, it is acute, more acute within our region. Yep. Uh, Qatar has taken the lead within our region, especially when it comes to labor reforms. But there's still a lot more for us to do, and, we're, and every day for us is a continuous uh, a step forward. Uh, and, and we've got great partners. Yep. Builder and Woodwork uh, International a Trade Union is, is one of our partners. We've got uh, a uh, third-party independent inspector that comes and reviews our projects and uh, produces an independent report annually uh, to, to highlight our progress or our regress. Well, so Concordia is about partnerships, and I understand that one of the things we wanted to do today is, is to talk a little bit about a partnership that you have formed with the International Rescue Committee. So, yes. Hassan, I'll pass it to you first, and then David would love to hear your closing thoughts. Well, I think David very, uh, very succinctly and very eloquently mentioned, the, you know, exactly what the partnership is about. It's about utilizing, you know, the World Cup uh, in, in developing uh, programs from now till the lead up to 2022. Mm -hmm. And during 20, 2022, we're also in discussions with FIFA to bring them on board as well. Uh, during the World Cup as well, we'll, we'll have a specific uh, uh, element as well focusing on this partnership. Yeah. And then it will last for the next four years as well. Uh, raising, uh, as I said, both de delivering a program and at the same time raising awareness for the refugee situation, the displacement situation of, of uh, uh, the people throughout the world. David, any thoughts? Well, uh, a few. Uh, this is uh, potentially uh, a really landmark initiative because it tackles some of the hardest issues in the humanitarian sector, but it's also willing to use a global stage to make a global yeah. point. Uh, it's important in respect of the previous question that we will continue to be advocates for the rights of refugees and for all countries to sign the Refugee Convention. We'll continue to be advocates for the rights of migrants. We'll continue to stand up for labor standards. The charitable sector isn't an alternative to those standards, and so it's encouraging to hear uh, Hassan al Thrawadi talk in such a clear way about his commitment to raising standards and to the independent uh, audit of them. From our point of view, it's essential that we understand that a global event like the World Cup that ignores the plight of those who are not able to make the journey yeah. voluntarily, who are forced into migration involuntarily, that's a really important statement in and of itself. The fact that we have the opportunity to really show what humanitarian endeavor can do and then showcase the real stories of the people who are refugees and displaced people on the world's largest stage is really a tremendous opportunity. We're now entering the design phase. We've signaled to each other our intent to cooperate. We've created the partnership. We're now sitting down together to map out the crises, the countries, the programs. And so in the early new year, we'll be able to set out the full menu of what's going to happen, both in the first phase up to 2022, and then in the second phase beyond 2022. And the significance is long-term, sustainable, inspiring change in people's lives. That is what the World Cup should be all about, and it's certainly what our work is all about. Well, bravo. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Thank both of you, much. for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much.